Hello, I'm Janet Mills, Attorney General for the State of Maine. Welcome to Consumer Matters. This show is produced by the Attorney General's Consumer Information and Mediation Service. Each month we'll try to offer practical advice on some difficult problems faced by Maine consumers. If you have a consumer dispute or question, you can call or write us and we'll see if we can help you. In some cases, we can even help mediate your dispute. Please watch the screen for ways you can contact us. We hope you find today's show helpful, and thanks for watching. Welcome to Consumer Matters. I'm Martha Currier, Complaint Examiner in the Consumer Protection Division at the Maine Attorney General's Office. In a few moments, I'll talk with Maine Secretary of State Matt Dunlap regarding his anti-texting and driving campaign. But first, I have a couple of news and consumer items to share with you. Attorney General Janet Mills recently reported statistics on drug overdose deaths through the first nine months of 2016. With 286 deaths through the end of September, overdose deaths have already exceeded the total number of 272 for all of 2015. This dramatic increase is mainly due to illicitly manufactured, which is non-pharmaceutical, fentanyl and fentanyl analogs, although the number of deaths due to other drugs is also increasing. One person a day is dying from a drug overdose in Maine, said Attorney General Mills. I cannot stress how dangerous these drugs are. My office is working with law enforcement around the state to stop the trafficking of these drugs in Maine. As we work to stem the supply, we must also decrease the demand for these drugs. Maine must expand access to detox beds and long-term treatment so that people in the grips of addiction can find hope and live productive lives. With a new legislature convening soon, we need an all-hands-on-deck approach to combat this epidemic in a smart, nonpartisan, and comprehensive way. Of the 286 third-quarter deaths, year-to-date total, 195 are due to at least one illicitly manufactured drug, which includes heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, or non-pharmaceutical fentanyl, alone or in combination with other drugs or alcohol. 182 are due to illicitly manufactured opioid drugs, which includes heroin and morphine, non-pharmaceutical fentanyl and its analogs, a drug named U47700, and Kratom, alone or in combination with other drugs or alcohol. 176 are due to at least one pharmaceutical drug. That includes a wide variety of drugs available by prescription or over-the-counter, alone or in combination with other drugs or alcohol. 95 are due to at least one pharmaceutical opioid, like methadone or oxycodone, either alone or in con combination with other drugs or alcohol. 92 are a combination of illicitly manufactured and pharmaceutical drugs. These figures through the first three quarters of 2016 far exceed the numbers through the first nine months of 2015 as well. In 2015, there were 174 overdose deaths recorded in the first three quarters of the year compared to 286. If you or someone you know needs help to get off these drugs, please call 211 for resources in your area. Are you interested in helping Maine consumers resolve disputes with businesses? As you know from watching this show, the Attorney General's Office has a free and voluntary mediation service, which we're now recruiting new mediators for our upcoming February training. For more than 30 years, the Consumer Protection Division at the Maine Attorney General's Office has offered this free and voluntary complaint resolution program for Maine consumers, which is staffed by trained volunteers and overseen by full-time staff. Volunteers mediate consumer complaints over the phone or by mail in the Attorney General's Augusta office on a variety of matters, including express and implied warranty issues, landlord-tenant issues, car repairs and car sales, and more. Volunteers will be thoroughly trained in consumer law and mediation techniques at a February's three-day training. You will then volunteer between four and six hours a week on a schedule that's completely convenient to you during normal business hours under the supervision of members of the Attorney General's Consumer Protection Division, including me. To learn more about the program and download the application, please call me at the Attorney General's office at 626-8800 or send me an email at consumerperiodmediation at maine.gov. Any parent or guardian of a child knows the milestones that come with turning 16, learning to drive, maybe dating, or thinking about college. But now there's one more, checking their credit report. Now I know what you're thinking, my kids don't have a credit card, a house, or a car, so why should they check their credit report? Because somebody else could be using your child's personal information. It could even be a family member. We've heard from uh, of-age children whose relatives have used their social security numbers to obtain cell phones and utilities, but until they became old enough to get a credit card and sign their own contracts, was the fraud even discovered? 
Once a child or anyone's social security number is stolen, it can be used by identity thieves. The thief might apply for a car and mortgage loans, government benefits, credit cards, get a place to live and utilities, or even file taxes in your child's name and get a refund. Checking to see if your child has credit history and then thoroughly reviewing it when they turn 16 can help you spot signs of identity theft. If you find false or inaccurate information, you'll have time to correct it before your child applies for a job or a loan for college or a car or tries to get a credit card or a place to live. To get a credit report for your child, you'll need to contact each of the three credit reporting bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, and ask them to conduct a manual search to see if your child has a credit report. Each company will check for a report related to your child's social security number. Generally, children won't have credit reports unless someone is using their information for fraud. If you discover your child has a credit report with incorrect or false information, go to identitytheft.gov to report the problem and the steps outlined to resolve it. The website has information and recovery plans for more than 30 types of identity theft. Additionally, here in Maine, you should consider locking down your child's credit with a credit freeze. Freezes are free if you have credit reports like you or I do, or if a child doesn't have a credit report established, it'll cost about $10, and that is the one, a one-time fee. Check their credit report so you can help them now to avoid significant problems down the road. Remember those fake IRS scam calls that were bombarding our home and cell phones earlier this year? Have you gotten any recently? Neither have I. But the reason is because back in October, law enforcement agencies in India raided nine call centers and detained 700 workers, ultimately arresting about 70 of them in this well-known imposter scam. Since October, the decrease in calls is substantial. The Maine Attorney General's office fielded, on average, several hundred calls per month on this one scam alone. During the month of November 2016, we only heard from 15 individuals. While this particular scam appears to be over, please continue to be cautious when anyone calls you out of the blue and continue to pay attention to the red flags like pressure to act immediately or else, request for payment via wire transfer, prepaid debit cards, or something other than a credit card or check, and anyone who won't let you call back and verify the debt through a number you know to be true. These are all sure signs of a scam. But just as one scam winds down, though, another one involving the IRS has ramped up. In this case, the real IRS has issued a warning to all consumers to be aware of a new tax bill scam. This one will make you queasy. It involves a fake IRS tax notice that claims you owe money as a result of the Affordable Care Act. The IRS says the fake notices are designed to look like real IRS CP2000 notices, which the agency sends if information it receives about your income doesn't match the information reported on your tax return. The IRS says many people have gotten the bogus notices, which usually claim you owe money for the previous tax year under the Affordable Care Act. As tax season nears, we'll see more. The good news? Well, there are red flag warnings that can help you avoid becoming a victim. For example, and as I've said to you before, the IRS will never initiate contact with you by email or through social media. They'll never ask you to pay using a gift card, a prepaid debit card, or wire transfer. They'll never request personal or financial information by email, text, or social media. Or they won't, I'm sorry, and they won't threaten to immediately have you arrested or deported for not paying. In the new scam, the fake CP2000 notices often arrive as an attachment to an email, a definite red flag, or by US mail. Other telltale signs of this fraud include there may be a payment link within the email. Scam emails can link you to sites that steal your personal information, take your money, or infect your computer with malware. Don't click on the link. The notices request that a check maybe needs to be made out to the IRS. There's a subtle difference here that you might not otherwise catch, but real CP2000 forms ask for taxpayers to make their checks out to the United States Treasury if they agree they owe taxes. If you've received a CP2000 notice and questions it, its actual authenticity, you can see a real one on the irs.gov website. Just search for understanding your CP2000 notice on that site. If it turns out to be bogus, delete the email. Don't respond to it. That will keep your hard-earned dollars where they belong in your pocket. You're about to rent an apartment, you've saved for your security deposit and lined up the moving truck, but have you checked your credit report? I'm talking a lot about that today, but landlords may, so you should too. If a landlord does a background check, here are some things to know about your rights. 
Landlords can check your credit, your criminal history, and even your rental history. They may ask your permission, but they're not required to. So if you know you're, you'll be looking for a new place to live, or if, if you're about to renew your lease, then here are a few things you can do. Go to annualcreditreport.com and check your credit for free. That way you can fix any errors before a landlord sees them. Give the landlord your full name, first, middle, and last, and date of birth. This helps make sure the landlord gets the information on the right person. If you have a criminal history or previous housing court actions, gather any paperwork showing how the action was resolved in case you need to fix errors. Now what if the landlord refuses to rent to you or charges you more because of something in a background check? Then you have rights. The landlord must give you notice of the action orally or in writing or electronically. The notice must give you contact information for the company that supplied the report. The notice must tell you about your rights to correct inaccurate information and to get a free copy of the report if you ask for it within 60 days of the landlord's decision. You should obtain your free report, fix any errors, and have the company that supplied the credit report give a corrected one to the landlord. And tell the landlord about the mistake too. The Attorney General's Office also has a consumer law guide, chapters about renting an apartment, and a model lease so you know what your renter's rights are. You can find the chapters on our website, maine.gov ag, or call us at the Consumer Protection Division and we can send them to you. I'm going to take a quick break, but stay right there because Secretary of State Matt Dunlap is here to talk about a great program he does around the state to educate young drivers. Tell him that I've begun to dream of things, of things to come, and tell the trees not to look for me. I'm going to find some peace of mind. Wake the sun. The sun, wake the sun, wake the sun. Hey, wake up. Hey, Brittany. Does anybody know how many pills she took? I don't know. Should we call 911? Brittany, no way, we'll get in trouble. You guys, I don't think she's breathing. How long has she been there like this? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Weren't you watching her? Weren't you? No, I'm not her we babysitter. Do. Brittany, please wake Brittany. up. She's Brittany, 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 how many oh, pills did she take? You guys, we can't just leave her Come like on, this. we gotta get out of here. We mean? gotta get out of here, let's go. My son, William, is an extremely passionate person. Hence his success in ski racing, his success in the molecular genetics major at the University of Vermont. It's that same passion that convinced Will to try heroin. He was found dead the morning of March 23rd from a heroin overdose. I have had friends, very good friends, ask me the question, what would you say if you could talk to Will again? I would say, I love you, Will. And soon after that, I would say, what did you think you were doing? What I want people watching this to know is that you might be the brightest guy in the world and the best skier, but you're mortal. This can happen to you. Please don't make your friends and family have to live the unthinkable. And I am without one of the most remarkable people I have ever known in my life because of it. And it kills me every day. Since being online is part of our lives, it's a good idea to take steps to protect ourselves our information, and our computers. One thing you can do to stay safe is to limit your online friends to people you actually know. By turning on privacy settings and learning about location-based services, you can keep strangers from learning too much about you. And don't give certain information out to anyone. Your social security number, family bank accounts, and even your password can cause lots of trouble in the wrong hands. You can protect yourself and your computer by keeping up to date on security software and being cautious about what you click. Emails, P2P downloads, and promises of free stuff can hide viruses and spyware. 
Being online is part of your life, so stop and think before you click. Welcome back. Texting and driving is a problem that you hear more and more about on the news. Secretary of State Matt Dunlap is charged with helping to keep Maine's roads safe and has an aggressive and impactful anti-text and drive campaign going on right now to tell us about. Welcome, Secretary. Thanks for having me again. So talk to us about, I mean, there's no doubt that texting and driving is a problem for people of all ages, kids all the way up to people in their 70s and 80s. Uh, talk about how big the problem is in Maine. This is the most significant highway safety danger of our time. You know, we, we always talk about the context of highway safety around things like drunk driving, mm -hmm. driving to endanger after suspension. Drunk driving has always been seen as sort of the pinnacle of, of, of danger on the highways. Texting and driving far surpasses that. And getting that word out has been really the challenge that we've been trying to, to address here over the last couple of years. Remember when we didn't have cell phones? It really wasn't that long ago. I, I got my very first cell phone when I was in the legislature, which is a few years ago now. But nonetheless, this is relatively new. Young people have grown up with it. They don't know anything different than instant access mm -hmm. to the world through their smartphone or iPhone or whatever. So you know, as we go around um, looking at the trends in highway safety, what we've noticed is there's been a sharp uptick in recent years of car crashes at highway speeds where no brakes are being used. So, uh, and that's directly attributable, attributable to distracted driving. And distracted driving, you know, there's a lot of different ways to be distracted when you're driving. It, it can be, you know, the, the visual distraction, taking your eye off the road, taking your hands off the wheel, taking your mind off what you're doing. All three of those elements are what ha is happening when you're texting or reading a text or checking an email. Now, I was approached with this program that we've been taking to Maine schools by AT&T, and I was a little cynical about it at first. I thought, you know, this is a major cell phone provider uh, talking to me about this program. Well, it turned out the CEO of AT&T lost a family member in a texting crash and has taken this on as something of a personal crusade. Owen Smith, the regional vice president of AT&T here in Maine, he and I have been going to a number of high schools around the state uh, and doing assemblies, and it's been really dramatic. Now, going through the statistics of you know, how much more likely you are to have a crash or how many times people text and how young people expect to reply within five minutes is a pretty good way to get a gymnasium full of high school kids to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. But is. when we start showing them the videos that have been made by some of the film producers around the country uh, around texting and driving and what happens to families and what happens to communities in these crashes. Generally speaking, you can't hear a pen drop in the, in the entire gymnasium. And, and that's, what, that's what hooks them. That's what they really see firsthand what happens to people at high speed, in high speed crashes. So the, the dangers of texting and driving are significantly higher than if you're driving intoxicated. Because typically when people have had a couple of drinks, what we find in our research is they try to be more careful. Sure. You know, they focus. They don't want to get pulled over and get, you know, arrested. Um, but when they're texting and driving, everything's fine. They're not intoxicated. They're not impaired. They're just looking over here. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they're in the woods. And uh, that's some really bad things happen at that juncture. It's not just high rates of speed, though. It's people, I, I live and work here in Augusta, you know, just going up the main drag, Western Avenue, people stopping at a light, you know, there's a light every so many blocks, and they're texting as they're, you know, waiting for the light to pass. How do we stop people from texting? I mean, it's not just kids. The campaign is great, and, and the video, it can wait, that AT&T has on their website is wonderful. But how do we get through to adults, too? I'm afraid it's going to take some time. It took us a few years to really get people to think differently about drinking and driving. Mm. You know, that was something when I was a kid. I remember as in high school, in the Portland Sunday Telegram, there was an advertisement, a quarter-page advertisement from, a, from an area police department saying they didn't have the staff to, to pull everybody over, just, you know, hoping that people would drive carefully on New Year's Eve. I remember police following people home who were, you know, driving drunk and just make sure they got yep, home all right. That. Uh, it wasn't, and then finally somebody said, well, why are we putting up with this? Why are we going through this annual ritual around prom time and graduation time and Christmas, people getting killed in these horrific crashes that are completely unnecessary? I think we, because we've been through that, fortunately, I think people are thinking ahead of the curve a little bit, getting in front of this issue before it becomes something that you take for granted. 
And kids have to talk with parents. Parents have to talk with kids. We have to talk with each other. And one of the things that people have to do is it's a, it's a remarkable device that we do with AT&T. They have a big sign-up board. Mm -hmm. And they ask all the kids at the end of every one of these events to sign a pledge that they won't text and drive. What we find is that's remarkably effective. If no people, kidding. If people say they won't do it, they think twice. And for me, I, I used to be one of the worst offenders, quite frankly. I drive three hours in, a day home, to and from work. Um, reality is I'm third in line for governor. People want to talk to me. You know, I'm Secretary of State. I, people are asking me to approve this, approve that. And, and ironically, I remember pulling over by the side of the road because my phone kept buzzing urgently. And it was to approve a program for a texting and driving oh, seminar. For and I was on my way to a texting and driving seminar when I was in Old Town, and I got rear-ended at 35 miles an hour by somebody who was texting and driving. Oh my gosh. This is an epidemic. But I think if we, if we think about it in terms of what our choices are, and I made an affirmative choice that I was not going to be that guy that hurt or killed somebody else. And when you think about it in that context, it's really easy just to, to put the phone in your, in your briefcase or you know, even in the trunk of your car, turn the thing off completely. And because truly, you, know, you think about the context of how we communicate and how we used to communicate. One of the most startling things I've heard in this context was I have satellite radio. And on D-Day, the anniversary of D-Day, they were playing the news flashes from, from June 6, 1944. And people didn't really know what was going on. And they were like clinging to their radios as they got these very vague alerts every few hours what was happening in Normandy. And that's the way the world used to be. And we lived with it and we succeeded that way. Right but we are, have become addicted to instant information and just stepping away from that and being present in the moment is not only good for our health on the roads, it's good for our family life. It's good for our relationships with each other because then we interact more. So that's a little bit beyond the highway safety issue, it's, but it is true. And people need to talk about that. I mean, I know that I, I'm guilty of uh, doing uh, a texting while driving every now and again. I actually had a girlfriend who called me and said, put down the phone, I'll talk to you soon, we'll text later. The good news is all the cell phone companies have it, free apps that will send out an out of office auto reply at, when, you're, when you're in motion in a car. So it basically stops receiving messages and the person who's trying to contact you is given a message that you're driving. So you don't even see it. You don't, you don't even, even see it. It doesn't ping, it doesn't beep, it doesn't. So you get a voicemail or a text or whatever, but it doesn't beep and you don't see it, you're not distracted by it. And the person trying to message you understands the reason why you're not getting back to them right away. So those apps can be downloaded from, uh, I'm trying to think, a Google Play Store or wherever you... Uh, or or AT&T has one, T-Mobile has one, Verizon has one. So, you know, all the major carriers have them now and they're free. And I think that that's something that, you know, people want to think about as they're getting their new phones over, over Christmas or the holidays or getting it installed. And it's, it's, it could be life-saving. And that's something that's, I think, worth a free app. I think that's great. So while you're driving, when it, you get up to a certain speed, in the car, it notice, it recognizes that and takes care of it for you. You don't even have to think about it. You don't have to turn it on or off. That's right, and that's a, that's a really handy feature because when I came in here, because I have phones, I had to remember to turn them off. This app does it for you. And how often are you going around the state? Are you trying to hit all of the high schools in Maine? That would What's take a few plan? years. We have a lot of high school, but basically we, we, we reach out to schools on a programmatic basis, uh, do it regionally. We've been to places like Guilford and Wyndham and uh, did, we did one in Old Town where I live. We've done them in Sanford, a lot in Southern Maine, the bigger schools. The, the first one we did was at Wyndham High School. Mm -hmm. And the, the faculty there were greatly engaged. And they actually had a couple of recent alumni who had been in a texting and driving crash. They were hit by somebody who was texting. And there is nothing I've ever seen that was more effective than that moment as they were playing a slideshow of these two students while they had been in school on the track team at graduation. And then they came across the stage. One had a walker and one had crutches. And this was nine months after the crash. Oh my so um, that I think probably had, I wish we could have had them come to every school we've been to with us. But we've been all over the state, and most recently in Madison. Um, and we're reaching out to schools uh, as my schedule permits, as their schedules permit. And we do these presentations, and they're very, very well received by the students, especially, which is great, really gratifying. Do you think that there's some sort of legislation that is necessary to get parents or just get adults to stop texting and driving? Or is it something that we really can't legislate our way out of? We've really, uh, you can only legislate so much. And it's already been prohibited to text while driving. 
The challenge for law enforcement is when they see somebody with their phone, are they texting or are they dialing the phone? Because it's still legal to make a phone call with your cell phone while you're driving. New Hampshire has taken the next step and they prohibited cell phone use altogether while driving. And it's a fine. So in Maine, if you get caught texting and driving, and this happened to an associate of mine who was at an intersection and was sending a text message, blue lights came on and they were given a $310 ticket for texting and driving, even at a stop sign or stoplight, because the, the issue is whether or not you're in control of the vehicle and understand and are aware of the, of the environment around you. And you're not when you're texting whether you're stopped at a stoplight or not. And this is one that's happened. We heard this one. Some of you have been at a stoplight. They figure they're okay. They're texting. And then somebody beeps their horn. They assume that the light's green and they got to go, and yeah. they want to rear-ending the car in front of them. So they instinctively hit the accelerator, and they just plow into a car. So um, there's just no safe time to use a cell phone when you're, when you're in control of the vehicle. Um. And I think it's important to remember if uh, you follow the same thought process as drunk driving and being in control of the vehicle, the keys in the ignition, the car is running, uh, that's when you're in, is that considered a control under the law? When you're in the driver's seat. Okay. It doesn't even have to be running. Okay. So we've seen people charged with OUI who were parked by the side of the road or intoxicated and the car was shut off. I see, okay. Because the car had to get there somewhere. Yeah, somehow, right, so. right, right. That makes sense. I think my brother told me about someone getting a ticket in line at Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah. Um, they, were just, they weren't on the roads, but they were still in their car. They were waiting for their coffee. Yeah. Um, and so we have to be uh, proactive, talking to one another um, and just educating each other about the dangerous uh, uh, of this uh, problem. So if people want to watch these videos, they, they're they, on your website? They're on the website. They're online. There's a lot of the ones that we haven't even used that are online. Um, it, uh, Werner Herzog directed one that AT&T uses. It's a slightly longer version. It's about 25 minutes long. It's called From One Second to the Next. Uh, that one is incredibly powerful, and I, it, 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 they interviewed people who'd both been in crashes and who had been victims of crashes, as well as some of the other ones, the shorter 10-minute ones that we use. Those are on the website, the AT&T website. Google them and you'll find them. This has been great. Anything else that we haven't touched on that we need to get to today? Don't do it. Just don't, don't do, do it. it. Don't All do right. it. Secretary of State Matt Make Dunlop. that choice. Thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you for Always having me. Always great having you here. Thanks. I hope you found today's show interesting and informative. If you have a community group that might benefit from a presentation about our office and how to be a smart consumer, please contact me at the Attorney General's office. The goal of this program is to give you information. We can't give you legal advice. However, we offer a free consumer mediation service to help resolve any dispute you have with a business. I'm Martha Courier. Thank you for watching.